Hello, my friends. So today I want to talk to you about the healing response. When I entered medical school, the first few lessons were about two subjects. One was homeostasis, <clears throat> which was first defined in a useful way by the French uh, physiologist Claude Bernard. And he said homeostasis is the constancy of the milieu interior. It's a dynamic non-change in the midst of change. So your blood sugar remains within a certain range, your hormones within a certain range, your body temperature, your immune function dynamic non-change in the midst of change. And so homeostasis is self-regulation. And therefore, uh, we might say the healing response. The other lesson that one learns in medical school right off the bat is, or the other subject is inflammation. Inflammation is also a protective response. Acute inflammation uh, protects you when you have injury you fall down, you bruise your knee, that's inflammation, prevents you from bleeding to death. Or you encounter an infection, like a pneumococcus, and your body produces uh, antibodies uh, and brings the inflammatory response to the area of injury, in, that case, in this case, exposure to infection. So that's also a healing response. When inflammation and the healing response, which is... Uh, uh, which is homeostasis go out of balance and are not integrated, fine-tuned, then we get sick. An over-aggressive immune system uh, puts you at risk for allergies, autoimmune illnesses. An under-aggressive or inappropriately responding immune system, uh, in other words, a depressed immune system, um, predisposes you to infection and even cancer. So there's a dance between homeostasis and inflammation. Chronic inflammation is a risk factor along with stress for almost every chronic illness uh, with the 5% or less that are due to fully penetrant genes. <clears throat> so today what I want to talk to you about is the healing response. We're when we are in the fight flight mode or the reactive mode, then we have something happening in our autonomic nervous system, which is called sympathetic overdrive. Pupils dilate, heart rate speeds up, blood is diverted from the brain and the stomach to the muscles so we can run and we can fight. And uh, everything is on hyper alert. And this hyper alert, hyper vigilant state uh, causes inflammation is accompanied by stress, which is the perception of threat and its components, anger, hostility, guilt, shame, depression, anxiety, fear, all uh, as uh, the perception of threat, which ultimately causes damage to the body. So sympathetic overdrive is the cause of, and stress is the cause of every major illness with the few exceptions. And it's also the cause of mental distress and premature aging, Alzheimer's, heart disease, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, autoimmune illnesses, and predisposition to cancer. The sympathetic nervous system is therefore the protective nervous system, but when it is hypervigilant or hyperactive, then we see problems. Opposing the sympathetic drive uh, is another part of our autonomic nervous system that is called the parasympathetic nervous system. And the dominant nerve in the parasympathetic nervous system is the vagus nerve. I've spoken on this before. The vagus nerve um, is the vagabond nerve, the wandering nerve in the body. It's the 10th cranial nerve. 
and it um, actually is referred to as the healing nerve, as the rest and rejuvenate nerve, also as the nerve that renews the body and helps us digest food and also engage in social interaction. And it travels from the midbrain, it influences the oculomotor nerve, which is eye movements, facial nerve, which is facial expressions, glossopharyngeal nerve, all the activity that is engaged in swallowing, etc. But also tone of voice, it influences deep breathing and uh, heart rate variability. And then it pierces the diaphragm and interacts with all the hollow and solid organs of the body with only one purpose, self-regulation and return to homeostasis. So we can say activation of the vagus nerve is the healing response. Here are the most important things to know about the vagus nerve. Number one, it counteracts sympathetic overdrive. Number two, it optimizes mind, body, brain, perceptual activity as an integrated unified activity that leads to self-regulation, healing, and the return to wholeness. Health is the memory of the return to wholeness. Number three, it increases heart rate variability and decreases heart rate and lowers blood pressure. Number four, it restores metabolic balance or homeostasis and reduces inflammation. I've already mentioned that, but this is very important because metabolism is influenced moment by moment by the nature of your experiences in awareness and how you interpret them. Number five, the vagus nerve is responsible for regulating hormones, including insulin, cortisol, adrenaline, Hormones associated with appetite, hormones such as ghrelin and leptin, which regulate not only appetite, but metabolism and connect them to sleep-wake cycles. So it uh, regulates uh, our endocrine or hormonal system. Number six, um, the vagus nerve improves taste and smell sensitivity. So the enjoyment of sensory experience, not only taste and smell, but other senses. Uh, number seven, it stimulates digestive processes. Number eight, the vagus nerve stimulates peristalsis, the contraction, sequential, and relaxation of your bowels and your, or, and your uh, yeah, small and large intestine, and therefore uh, stimulation of peristalsis peristalsis is very important for elimination. So number eight, vagus nerve helps eliminate or helps the body eliminate uh, toxins and also waste products. Number nine, the vagus nerve uh, regulates breathing. Number 10, uh, the vagus nerve uh, regulates uh, the what you call hypothalamic pituitary axis. So the hypothalamus is connected to our emotional brain, and then it influences the pituitary, which secretes hormones like growth hormone, ACTH, which stimulates the adrenal glands, and then other hormones, uh, TSH, which stimulates the thyroid gland, and uh, ultimately is the master regulator of every endocrine gland in the body, therefore all the hormones in the body. And the vagus nerve is that which regulates this hypothalamic pituitary axis that's also influenced by emotions. Number 11, the vagus nerve is the foundation uh, for, uh, you might say, um, everything that uh, we call uh, um, epigenetics, neuroplasticity. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, social and emotional interactions, all connected to each other. Okay, epigenetic is the on-off switches that modulate the activity of our genes as needed 
to make proteins in the moment for whatever experience you're happening. And these proteins, of course, serve as enzymes and catalysts and messenger molecules and self-regulatory mechanisms through ligands and receptors and feedback mechanisms. So uh, vagus nerve is the foundational basis of epigenetic modulation, neuroplasticity, which is long-term and short-term hetero and homosynaptic potentiation of neurons, which is use dependent. In other words, even though your genes were originally creating your brain, now your brain is being sculpted by every experience you have through epigenetic modulation and neuroplasticity. So this is all that the vagus nerve does. <clears throat> and there are many ways to activate it. So let's go over them. Smiling, smiling, simulates the corners of the eyes and also, and therefore, the ocular motor nerve, which is connected to the vagus nerve. Smiling also activates facial expressions and actually enhances emotional well-being, but activates the vagus nerve for the healing response. Then there is toning, humming, chanting, singing, Mm, um, all these activities, singing, chanting, humming, activate the vagus nerve. Deep, slow breathing activates the vagus nerve, particularly if the expiration is longer than the inspiration. Bringing awareness to the heart, just that will regulate the vagus nerve, change heart rate variability. Anytime you're stressed, just stop, bring your awareness to the heart. Okay, what else? Yoga asanas, every single posture of yoga influences the simulation and activation of vagus nerve and a different branch. So yoga, pranayama, pratyahara, which is withdrawal of the senses, and interoceptive awareness, uh, and actually activating the internal organs through bandhas <clears throat> and kriyas, which are part of yogasana, will also stimulate different branches of the vagus nerve. Contracting and releasing the anal sphincter, the urethral sphincter, and even the uh, walls of the vagina, Kegel exercises. And these are also called mudras, you know, Udana, Udhyana Mudra, Muladhara Bandha, Udhyana Bandha, Jalandhara Bandha, where they are the principal ways of contracting and relaxing sphincters, and they all stimulate the vagus nerve. What else? Bitter foods will stimulate the vagus nerve. Social and emotional interaction in the direction of Empathy, compassion, joy, equanimity will stimulate the vagus nerve. Laughing will stimulate the vagus nerve. Chanting, as I already mentioned, will stimulate the vagus nerve. Exposure to cold. If you take cold water and you actually just wash your face with it or take a cold shower, will stimulate the vagus nerve. And then uh, any experience that brings you joy being in nature, forest bathing, grounding, watching a sunset or a sunrise, or a beautiful piece of art, music, will all stimulate the vagus nerve. So now you have a lot of ways to stimulate the vagus nerve. And by the way, there are other branches of the vagus nerve, which are very, you know, very small, but you can find a branch of the vagus nerve in the ear, uh, right behind, uh, right when you when you put your finger in your ear, and if you go behind the eardrum and above the eardrum, there's a little ridge, and that ridge uh, has the auricular branch of vagus nerve. So you can stimulate that and bring about healing and homeostasis as well. Now there are soon um, to be developed digesuticals and electroceuticals which will actually stimulate these different branches of vagus nerve and will bring about passive healing even when 
you're doing some other activity. I mentioned forest bathing, grounding, walking on the beach, walking on the sand, walking on the grass, using electrical devices to ground yourself. All these are new technologies. And with these new technologies, looking at facial expressions, tone of voice, correlating them to heart rate variability, immune function, blood pressure, and even heart rate can help us create deep learning systems that will help you self-regulate your biology through technology as well. And this is where VR, augmented reality, uh, and uh, immersive experiences, and metaverse uh, will soon be used to bring about healing and self-regulation. So that's why I say the future of well-being is very bright. It is precise, it is personalized, it is predictable, it is preventable, it is participatory, it's a process. And in fact, many illnesses are reversible. So this is the future. And some of these techniques have been practiced since ancient times in wisdom traditions. But today they are finding validation in science. I'll be sharing more of the healing response with you in, in the near future. But let me know if you find this useful. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.